Hi, my name is Noah Gift, and I'm one of the authors of Practical MLOps, and I teach at some of the top universities in the world in machine learning, cloud computing, and data science. And in this particular lecture, what I'm gonna cover is the Matthew effect and also data storytelling. So how can you use data to tell a story and then also give conclusions to the executives in your company? So in particular, we're gonna dive into body weight I'm gonna dive into my own story with how I discovered how intermittent fasting can be helpful. Uh, I also dive into Major League Baseball players, what effects do body weight have on these Major League Baseball players. And then this further leads us into something called the Matthew Effect. So why is it that the longer uh, a player in Major League Baseball uh, plays, the longer they live? And why is it that in California, the most wealthy areas have had the prices of their houses appreciate the most, right? And so this will be one of the, the core ideas that I'll explore in this particular lecture. And at the end, we'll come up with some recommendations about how we can actually address those problems. Let's go ahead and get started. What, what we're gonna talk about today is uh, data storytelling. And I have a notebook here that's linked that is in Colab. And the general idea with uh, data storytelling is that you may start with an idea and then pull lots of different data sources to explore more ideas uh, and, and, and basically start with one, but maybe, maybe end up with 10 different ideas and then present a conclusion towards the end where the conclusion doesn't necessarily have to be final. The, conclu the conclusion could be that you want to do further research, but you have basically told somebody something that's useful and they can you know decide to go to go deeper on the data if they need to one of the things that i'll start with here is that um, here's a data science uh, meets intermittent fasting uh, and basically when i was in college one of the things i was really interested in was nutritional science and i learned about calorie restriction this was in 1993 uh, and we did all kinds of experiments and I learned about the Krebs cycle and how glycogen storage works. And, you know, in a nutshell, uh, I, I had this whole period of time where I was very interested in fitness and health. And, and to make a long story short though, one of the things I discovered is that there's a new trend now called intermittent fasting. And what it does is it, it gets past this idea of trying to come up with a perfect solution and instead what it, it, it brings you into uh, the ability to take a heuristic like uh, a feeding window where you eat maybe from noon to 8 or 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. or maybe 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And there's lots of different ways that they describe this. One of them is called a 5-2, which is you eat for five days normal and then you have two days of calorie restriction. You have alternate day fasting. So in a nutshell, this is, this is a theory, but is, there is some science behind this intermittent fasting. Uh, and in particular, here's a good example, is that I, I had a collected data, body weight data for about 10 years. Uh, and this is the real data that I had. And you can see here, there's some interesting patterns that make me think that I should explore this data further. Uh, so here was at the beginning when I was getting an MBA and uh, I was I was pretty pretty healthy. For for me, I, I have a, a larger because I'm I'm uh, more athletic, and so I probably 220 is a good weight for me. But then when I went to three years of business school, very stressful, you know, studying a lot, and then got fatter, 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 and then it got all the way to like 245. So I gained like maybe 25 pounds from from studying so hard and not being healthy, and then I decided, okay, let's go let's get healthy again and I lose weight. And then what's interesting is that for a period of time, I was very fit. So my resting heart rate was in the 40s, which is very low, uh, but still my weight would go up and down, go up and down. And then one of the things that I had tried was to use this new technique. Okay, so does restricting, rest restricting calories actually reduce uh, body fat? And it turns out in my case, it dramatically uh, reduced body fat. So from 245 uh, pounds all the way down to you know 115 very, very quickly. Uh, and there's nothing different that I did other than restrict the time the, that I eat during the day. So I eat later towards the day. 
Uh, so one of the big experiments here is that here's some ideas that I'm going to use now to explore further uh, this this concept of of you know does it, are there some things that we could learn about about food and fasting that uh, I would like to go deeper on. So a few things that I did learn from this was processed food. There's research behind it is very bad for you in terms of uh, body fat, um, lack of sleep as well. You know, when there's periods where I was in a startup uh, or this is when I was working in the Bay Area at many startups, uh, also stress, lack of sleep causes body fat gain. And, and other things are helpful, daily exercise, intermittent fasting. And no matter how fit you are, you can be extremely fit, but you still can be fat because the you, you have to avoid um, man-made food. You have to, have to avoid lack of sleep. Uh, and so you can't exercise your way out of a bad diet, essentially. And so the, here's examples of healthy meal, you know, vegetables with some eggs, you know, th those kinds of things. So basically, uh, in a nutshell, I have some ideas here. So, so let's go a little bit deeper and see, well, what else can I tell with, with, with data? Can I, can I explore other things? So let's look at the actual data set itself. So in this example, um, if I want to look at my own uh, body weight over the last 10 years, I can pull it into pandas and I can look at uh, the period of time, all the different days that I weighed different things, and I can create a, a data frame here. And, and you can see it's a very simple uh, exploration to begin with. It just shows the weight and then we can, we can see a describe. And this is very helpful because you can see that there are 1000 observations of body weight, but the, the mean is 225 or basically the, the, the median is 224. So that's pretty much the weight my body wants to stay at is, is 225. Uh, but max though, I got all the way to 245. So, I need to be careful to not go to that weight again. So if I look at this, I can even box plot. And what's nice about a box plot is you can see that this shows you typically where things are at. And then this shows all of the outliers, right? So, so pretty much my body weight over 10 years will, will be between 222 to 228, somewhere, somewhere in there. But there were some very large uh, outliers over here. To, to look at, and you can look at the same thing with a histogram as well, right? We can look at a graph here, and you can see that, it, it, again, the, the median is somewhere between 220, 225, it, but then there were some, there's some outlier observations over here and outlier observations over here. So I could even do a time series plot. And what's nice about a time series plot is that you can see the all thousand of these observations all at once. Uh, and potentially, maybe I could turn this later into maybe a machine learning model that allowed me to, you know, figure out whether I'm eating eating in a healthy way or, or my lifestyle is healthy, or I need to 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 watch certain things so that I I don't gain too much weight. Uh, and, and and so this is a this is a pretty helpful observation. So that that's about me. But what if I want to go deeper and learn more about how this would apply to other uh, other fields potentially to learn more information. So that's really one of the, the key aspects of data storytelling is you start with an idea, right? So I think that I know something now that I can improve my health by restricting the time period that I eat in. I have some real data for it, but let's go a little deeper. Let's look at other uh, data sets here. So here is something that uh, uh, I can pull in. This was a uh, data set from uh, Major League Baseball, and these are all Major League Baseball players that have um, been collected from really the last, I think, uh, maybe maybe 40 years or so. And you can see that the observations here are there are 50%. Uh, the median age is 27, uh, but also look, we have their weight, and their weight is goes everywhere from. Uh, you know, basically 200 pounds all the way up to 290 pounds here. But the average weight for a major league baseball player, you know, or the median weight is right around 200 pounds and they're six foot two. So major league baseball player, that seems like a good weight for them. And we could even look at the weights by um, positions as well. And what's interesting about baseball players is that you can see that the designated hitter 
is more like my body size, right? Is that they weigh about 225 and they're six foot two and a half, right? There's um, 74 inches. So that's about what I, that's actually exactly almost my, my metrics. But you can see that they're different based on which position that you're in. For example, if it's a shortstop, uh, shortstop is six foot, but 180 median. So there, there's different categories of body weight. So looking at just the weight may, may not be helpful without looking also at height and maybe even looking at how, how muscular a player is because the shortstop, for example, in baseball uh, has to be very fast. And so they, the, they, they want to be a little bit smaller. Uh, but then the, the ones that are hitting the ball here, like the designated hitter, they're larger uh, because they are f only focused on power and, and strength. And so if I wanted to look at this further, I could do a plot here and you can see that the, the different positions, they're, they're very different uh, median weight and, and height uh, observations here. And we could even look even further and we could look at height, weight by position, right? So we could look at the, the catcher, the first baseman, the second baseman. You can see they're all very, very different types of patterns. So, so I know more information now, which is that in professional sports, there are many different categories of athletes and there are bigger athletes and smaller athletes. And the, it depends on really the position that they play where body weight uh, comes into play here. So what could we do to, to kind of further bring into this data and, and, and look at it a little bit more here? Well, one of the things that we could do is we could model the data, right? So we could go into this data set here and we could say, okay, I want to, I want to, to try to train a model that maybe predicts how tall someone is from their weight for a major league baseball player. So I would grab this uh, variable here and then I would reshape it. Here's an example, I reshape this. And then once I've got into the reshaping, what I can do here is I can scale the data. And the, the reason for this in data science and machine learning is that machine learning requires data to be A, in numerical format and B, almost in all cases, it has to be scaled so that uh, there aren't uh, distortions with the prediction. Uh, so you can see once, once you scale data, you, you bring it down to a, like a range. So this would be very similar to, let's say, a drone, right? A drone is a, a smaller version of a larger aircraft. It's, a, it's the same kind of a concept. Uh, and then you can see here as well, I have the Y, which would be the height that I would predict. And then if I scale it, we can go down here. So then once I've done this, we can go into this data set here, these X train, X test, split it up. You can see that maybe I saved 10%. And then from there, I can go through and I can use, uh, let's say ridge regression, which is a, a type of regression that minimizes overfitting. Uh, and so I'm gonna try that first to see what happens. And I show, here's my uh, prediction here. I fit the model and then I describe, and you can see that these unscaled predictions converted to a data frame, right? So, so w once they're still unscaled, I need to scale them back so that I can interpret those predictions. So if we go through here and we plot these predictions uh, inside, we can see basically first I have to do a inverse transform. So I scaled it to do the machine learning. Now I need to scale it back. And once I do that uh, reverse transform, we can see that in fact, um, you know, we have a reasonable prediction. There's some, there's some situations where potentially there's some outliers here, but there, there does appear to be generally, uh, you know, a, the, the, the more you weigh in terms of professional baseball players, uh, typically uh, the, the, the taller you will be. And so we have, we have a pretty good accuracy here. And I can even go through here and print out the model accuracy. So if I wanted to go further and further and, and improve that model. So we have some other information now, right? So we first we learned that, um, that their you know, sleep and um, how, how, what periods of time you eat have an effect on body weight. We also now learned about athletes and their different athletes have different sizes and different muscularity depending on their position. Uh, so what else can we, we learn from this is let's dig into sugar consumption. So we know that man-made food, there's some research that it can cause severe problems. And in fact, this is a data set from 2013 that, that goes through and looks at sugar consumption in the United States. 
And so if I plot this out here, you can see that it shows the different states, the employment category, whether the, the person is employed, not employed, whether they're retired, uh, less than high school education, uh, high school education, some college or college graduate. And if we go through here and we clean up the data first a little bit so that it looks a little bit better, I can describe it. And what you can see here is that um, just even by like glancing through that if we look at the median sugar consumption of employed people, it would be 31, not employed 32, retired is much lower. So when, when people are uh, retired, potentially they're much healthier uh, or they're maybe older generations haven't been uh, influenced by bad eating practices. But, but look at this, if you have less than high school education, your, your sugar consumption is very high. Likewise, a college graduate, so, so educated people, they realize that sugar is toxic, and so they're avoiding the sugar, but the least amount of education you are, the most amount of sugar, so they're inversely correlated. So if we go through here, and I want to look at a map of the United States, we can, we can build out a, um, a, a folium chloropleth here that will show us that low education is equal to high sugar intake in the United States. And here's, here's a chart here that shows, in fact, that uh, basically, it, it, we don't have all of the states, but we have some of the states that the, the higher the education level uh, in the United States here, um, the lower the sugar intake. And then you can see that certain states have very, very high sugar intake. So in particular, we can see that um, you know Louisiana, Alabama, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina. There are some there are some real problems here with um, sugar intake, uh, and and that potentially this is an education. Uh, and then if we look at college education, we see that uh, there's a major reduction in, in sugar intake here. So once you once you start to factor in, like here's the college educated, right? You can see that basically there's all there's very low sugar consumption in California uh, as a state. Uh, and, but then once you get into college education, we only look at college educated much lower. So the only place where there's, there's still high sugar uh, intake is uh, Alabama, uh, but, but we've significantly re reduced it, right? So if we go back here again, we see these are the uneducated that there's still even a state by state trend. So if we scroll down here, well, what, what can we learn about this? Well, maybe we can look at the columns. We can look at the median values here and, and we see that again, that very, very low sugar consumption for college graduates, very high sugar consumption. And if I look at this, we can see that uh, there's three times higher sugar intake via college uh, grads and high school grads. So this is also uh, troubling, right? So, so we, we can see that maybe in the United States, there, there's a problem, not just with, um, with uh, you know, body weight, but, but potentially uh, the health effects of, of excess sugar intake can cause things like diabetes, uh, heart disease, uh, and, and, and maybe we also need to investigate how this would relate to something like COVID-19, right? We know that the United States has one of the highest death rates in the world per capita. So why, why is this? What's, what's the problem? with the United States and what are, what are the things that we can investigate. So let's, let's keep going a little deeper now and let's look at this data from the New York Times here. Uh, and they have uh, all of the, the COVID-19 data from uh, the start of uh, 2020. And if we look at the last few rows here, you can see that some of the places that have the highest uh, daily death rates uh, are currently uh, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, Wisconsin. So, so things have moved a little bit uh, in terms of the states that are the hotspots. And we can see that there's 20,000 observations. So let's dive into this a little bit more and let's describe it. And you can see that uh, you know, we, we we're able to get uh, the median per state per day would be something around 1,000 deaths per day. And if we, we scatter plot this, one of the things that we can see here as well is you know, that there has been uh, an exponential um, rise uh, in many states in terms of uh, both deaths and also the cases. And so let's look at it by date here. So if I go into pandas here, what I can do is I can grab 
this uh, data set for the states, look through here, and then filter potentially by dates. So I say from date time, import date, and I created uh, a time delta here. And we can say this is you know basically from a couple days ago, let's go ahead and look at uh, different states here and see what's going on. Uh, and that can, that can be really helpful to you know build out other charts here. So what I could also do is look at a distribution uh, of you know recently what's been happening and you can see here that you know these are basically the 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 uh, distribution of the the data by the date. And so what we can do as well is sort this data frame in places with highest deaths and cases and show them first. So I use that date range so I say I just want to see the recent data and I want to sort this data frame by the deaths and the cases. And we can look here and we can see that in fact, that there, California currently and New York um, are actually have the highest cases uh, and, and death rate, right? And so we can, we can also look at the shape of the data and you can see that there's approximately 50 states. And if we look at the top 10 states here, we can see California, Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, we can drop some columns here and uh, just grab the, a few of the, 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 the top states here, so, which would be California, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas. And then we can plot this out in a, in a chart. And so we can see that, that, that one of the things that's uh, happened recently is that basically with California, that there was a period where it was, it was under control and then you know, it flattened and then it went into this exponential uh, phase here where, where deaths were exponential. Texas is a little more flat. Florida is, is fairly linear. New York uh, was um, very exponential at the beginning uh, and now it's more linear. And then we also had exponential Pennsylvania. So then, then this goes into the, the question of, well, what, what about this other chart we had earlier about the intake of sugar? with um, uh, in, in these different states and could that be playing a role you know in the in the death rates uh, and that might be something that we could dig into as the obesity epidemic uh, we know that the, the COVID is m much more uh, intense for people that are obese and so is there a, a, a link here with um, with the sugar consumption in, in states and so we could go through here and we could plot these uh, top states here and then we could actually look at this uh, more interactive plot that might be helpful that will show us some things like here's Pennsylvania, right? Again, we see the, the rate here. We see Texas, you know, and, and uh, we, we have New York, we have California, Florida. So, so currently the leader is California. So what, what is interesting about California in particular is it's the largest uh, amount of cases because it obviously is a large uh, state, but that uh, it does appear to have a lower sugar consumption for a college educated, but I, I'm curious in terms of the death rate, if we were able to look at, are, are some of the people that are dying, are they already um, compromised by you know their health um, from eating, right? Are there, are there effects with diet uh, in terms of um, diabetes with uh, obesity and, and could those be playing a role in different states the, we, we may not be able to come up with a conclusion today but it's a good question to to dive into further and so um, let's dive into some of those real quick so let's combine that sugar data uh, here remember we had this earlier and let's let's combine the sugar data and the COVID-19 data and let's see, this, this might be able to tell us something. And also, we know that uh, there's the, in, in, in the United States, I don't think it's been the case necessarily in other countries, but the uh, data has been politicized in the United States. So it's very political, which whether you believe data or not believe data or conspiracies. In this case, though, let's look at the uh, 2016 election and we can see in, in, in terms of 2016, which state voted for which party. And can we combine all of those things together and maybe generate uh, additional information? So is there any kind of a correlation between sugar intake and potentially uh, political affiliation and also the death? And so what, what's fascinating here is that we can see that in terms of the deaths, that there, if, if we look at sugar intake as negatively correlated, 
So maybe this is not really a, a good enough in, a driver. Maybe we would need to look at the BMI, for example, uh, or even make a more granular breakdown. And also we see that also in, you know, maybe counterintuitively to some people that in fact, the Republican states, which have been the most lenient, are negatively correlated with, with uh, COVID-19 deaths. So that's one of the things about doing data science is that you, an intuition doesn't mean that, that it's true. You have to look at the data and we see that there's, there are, are some counterintuitive trends. You would think that, that places that have uh, high obesity, high sugar intake would have higher death rates. So, so maybe there, there's, a, um, there's a statistical paradox here as well, uh, where we would have to dig into the data and look at it more, more, fully, more, 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 for, more fully to, to see what's happening. So basically that's, a, that's an initial you know, um, test here where, 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 where we're coming up with yet more ideas about uh, health and weight. And so you know, what else can we, we determine from these states here? Well, we can also go back again to some housing data and we know that there's different wealth effects in different states here. So let's let's look at this the Zillow home prices data. And if we look at this Zillow data here, one of the things that we can find out uh, is that in particular that uh, the in, in in the United States that there are very different home prices. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cluster and look at the median prices here, and we can see that. The median home price recently in the United States, let's say as of uh, the end of January 2021, is $178,000, right? And if I look at different areas, though, if I look, for example, at um, let's take a look at some of the higher priced areas where they have big tech companies like Google, Facebook. Uh, and if we look at this, we got this inside, and I think I just need to say, uh, import cufflinks as, as CF, import cufflinks as CF here, and that will do it. There we go. And, and if, we, if we look at this, we can actually create uh, a visualization of the tech boom, regressive taxation and single family zoning. So we, we know here that the, in the United States that the wealth in terms of real estate has for the rest of the United States has been very even, right? So there is any kind of a, of a, of a wild effect here. This is just normal. Uh, but in other areas like San Francisco, Palo Alto, so, so regions where the government has allowed um, monopolies potentially to occur from Facebook and Google, and also for um, you know, legacy pro property tax laws where in, the, in California in particular, we know that the the property taxes that you pay from when you first bought never change, and so there's a inverse, um, basically a uh, incentive to never sell your house, uh, which also reduces the amount of open inventory and also makes the home prices go further. So we've got some stuff happening here where the the richer you are, the more rich you got. So already these homes back here in 1996 were very wealthy. They're they're let's say about five times higher but now once we go here they're they're multiples uh, of times higher than the median home price here so this is the rest of the united states has barely changed but these two regions here in california have been uh, subsidized basically and so a bubble has been has been formed intentionally through uh, government policies and so if we go through here and we say from scikit learn min max scalar and we go through here and we build these columns out, we can describe uh, this data and we can go through here and make a cluster. And one of the things that we can find out here about this cluster, uh, if we go through and cluster this, is that this is what I would call socialism for the rich or uh, you know, basically incentivizing in, in terms of this uh, cluster here, uh, basically people in uh, these these high cost regions to get even more wealthy. So if we see here that uh, we look at the appreciation ratio of these home prices, we can see that here's the 2021 
and here is the 1996 here. And so the current government policies in the United States are that for regular middle class people, things have been basically flat. But for other regions, there are both two trends, both in the breadth of the United States and the depth of the United States. We see that, in fact, that uh, places like Atherton, Aspen, you know, the, these places, Atherton in particular is the, uh, the place right in Palo Alto where, where a lot of people that work at these tech companies work. You can see that uh, over from the time period of 1996 to 2021, the, the housing prices have, have been multiplied by 8.5 times. So what, what was already a very wealthy house, 769, which is potentially maybe seven times higher than a normal house, the, the, the policies of not um, allowing taxes to rise uh, at the same rate, rate as appreciation, the restrictive zoning laws, and then also the tech companies that have gone in and pay people maybe $800,000 a year to work there have caused exponential growth in terms of the, the pricing. So there's a word for this, and it's called the Matthew effect, which is that basically the rich get richer and the poor get poorer without some kind of a policy that would uh, inter interact this. So if you applied something where you you actually had your tax according to your wealth, uh, this would potentially solve that problem. But we can also see there's also the uh, uh, the, the the growth in the appreciation. So this is the, the 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 gross appreciation, but then in a relative appreciation, again we can see a, a California property here, Santa Monica, where. Uh, again, because of the way the tax code is in, in, in California, that you could have bought a property in you know a long time ago, and 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 basically you never again have to pay you know real world property taxes, and the, it's very difficult to to build new houses in California. And again, there's a tech industry, so we've got these three factors. Now, simultaneous to that, we know that in these regions where we see uh, Atherton. Uh, as well, and we also see in Santa Monica that there's uh, the highest, some of the highest homeless rates in the United States uh, are actually right in these regions. So they're also directly correlated, the wealth of these these properties and the wealth that's been, it's called you know socialism for the rich, has also led to uh, a, a high degree of um, income inequality in the United States here. So we, we have discovered some interesting information here and we could, you know, go through and do more uh, information about about this and, and dig into it a little bit more. But we've seen, for example, that there is this concept of a Matthew effect. And so let's look through this conclusion and see how all these things factor into potentially a conclusion about, uh, you know, data storytelling. So in particular, we know that in the case of the major league baseball players that potentially being uh, having some form of muscularity uh, would be beneficial. And so you could think of this as the Matthew effect as well. The more muscular you have, muscularity you have in a way, the healthier you are, the more beneficial it is. The BMI, which is a measure of how much you weigh, may be a bad metric. So basically the BMI, if you're not familiar with it, shows essentially uh, a rating according to the the higher you weigh, the higher your BMI is, but it doesn't take into effect uh, muscularity. And there also does appear to be some evidence that intermittent fasting can be beneficial. And there's also some evidence of the Matthew effect for both the wealth, for we saw this in California, and with the tech companies, and also the health, that, that basically the rich get richer, where the people that have things, either health or, or, or wealth, often get richer without any kind of uh, nuanced government policy. So why do we know this? Let's dig into the details here. So one thing that we know here is that in terms of this data set, that this particular Major League Baseball uh, data set is from 1869 to 1983, so pretty long period of time. And over that 115 year time period, uh, baseball players have actually gotten larger on average. Um, so they've, they've grown because potentially they're eating more healthy, they're eating uh, nutritious food, and also their weight has gone up as well. So we, we know that the weight is going up potentially because they're getting you know, more muscularity. Uh, and 
they've contributed to a, to a, a larger body max index. And when you compare these athletes to the rest of the United States, they're basically about two inches taller and 20 pounds, 20 pounds heavier, but they're less obese. So this is a very important detail, which is, again, shows this Matthew effect, which is that, that uh, because of the prestige of a professional athlete and the benefits to, to being a professional athlete, that they, they're, they're benefiting from, you know, maybe even from, from birth, that uh, people are, are giving them very good food, they're, they're, they're exercising very well. And so we know here that uh, both groups exhibit similar height and weight trains. The majority of height and weight gains take place in cohorts that were born prior to World War II, but then it's slowed since 1939. So what we can see here as well is that potentially before World War II in the United States, there, there was um, real substantial problems in terms of getting proper food to eat. Uh, uh, there was a lack of uh, you know, vaccines, um, antibiotics. So, so many people were probably stunted in terms of their, 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 their growth and their height. But since World War II, there's been a lot of prosperity uh, in the United States. So that's, that's one thing that's, that does directly correlate with what we learned earlier. Also, another thing that we learned was compared to 20-year-old 20, 20 uh, U.S. males, Major League Baseball players live five years longer. So we, again, see this Matthew effect here is that if you're already healthy and you're already muscular and you already have good food and you're already exercising, it, it, it compounds on itself. And so basically major league baseball players live better lives than the, the majority of people in the United States. And in fact, the height, weight, which hand you are, uh, are, are, are basically unassociated with the risk of death in this population. But the career length though is inversely associated with risk of death. And so this again shows this Matthew effect which shows that players who uh, play longer, right? So they they have a very good career. They're getting more, your, your income goes up and up and up as you get older, uh, and that in particular, uh, because those players uh, gain additional income, they have better fitness. They have better training. I think LeBron James, the basketball player, pays one million dollars per year to to have a trainer and to do fitness. And so the conclusion is that in the United States, life expectancies with time and age all are improving, but in particular with Major League Baseball players, that, that they're already uh, improving in terms of their health, and then the best of the best uh, go, go you know, get, get even further improvement. So I think really the, the conclusion here would be that the Matthew effect, you can see it across all areas of uh, the world in terms of real estate health, in terms of fitness. And this might be something from uh, maybe like a large government policy is how can you make it so that everybody is healthy and that there are, you know, not distorted effects where only the, the best or the, or the elite get access to fitness and health and, and real estate. And so this could be potentially another story for us to dive into and go a little bit further is like, how can we, from a governmental policy here, dive into uh, th this particular effect and, and change it a little bit. So let's, let's look a little further as well at another data set that will go into this, uh, which is a basketball data set. And we can see some similar things here. So I'm gonna go to uh, this particular data set and what this one will show, actually I'll go to this link here, the, is that uh, essentially uh, when, when you're dealing with this Matthew effect and you start to look for it, it, it really is everywhere, right? So we'll, we'll do maybe a high RAM input here. So let's scroll down as well into a section of this notebook that, that talks about the, the same thing. So, uh, again, when you're dealing with a data, data science project here, an important part is, do you have enough data set, data sources available? So in the last set, you know, looking at it, I was able to collect data from my own body weight. I was able to collect data from 
the you know the the Center for Disease Control. I was able to connect data from Major League Baseball. I was, I was able to connect um, housing data, and I need all those data sources to tell the story about the Matthew effect. And and you can see this is another a visualization I did uh, that shows that here's another example like that in this particular uh, observation for the NBA, I had to grab the uh, arena attendance. I had to grab data from Wikipedia, which again goes back into the Matthew effect is I wanna see how popular the players are. I also want to look in terms of social media, who is the most uh, important social media. I'd like to look at census data, the performance on the court, the salary, you know, also endorsements. So this also could further get into and reinforce this concept of how can we deal with the Matthew effect in society and, and help maybe a larger section of people uh, by, by distributing more equally health and, and wealth. And so in particular here, uh, what I do in this, this example here is I also grab lots of different data, data frames here uh, and, and in this case, you can see each one of these attendance, endorsement, valuation, salary, right? So uh, that's, a, that's a kind of a key takeaway with storytelling for data is that it's important to have lots of different data sets that you're able to combine so that you can tell your story in a way that it goes across different data sets. If you just have one, it may be difficult to, to tell your story. And so let's scroll down here. And uh, I'm going to go down to another section that will kind of further uh, reiterate this, which is let's this this particular plot is a good one, which is is it shows uh, kind of again this this Matthew effect, but in this in this case, the Matthew effect has to do with the the player the teams in the in the NBA, and, and in particular, we can see that there's three different clusters of teams here, and this. This uh, axis right here shows the higher the ELO number is, the, the more successful the team is in terms of how many games they win. But in this particular uh, graph right here, or this axis, we can see the valuation of the teams in millions. And notice that these, these two teams here, the New York Knicks and the Los Angeles Lakers, were the, the, some of the worst teams in, in, uh, in terms of the performance, but they were still rewarded the most, which again is one of the problems with awarding the rich with more, is that in this particular case, we see that what's happening is because the median home price is so high in this region that they're still valued very highly, right? And so we can see that even in the case of people doing you know, an incredible job, their team, they're still not recognized for the effort that they're putting out because of the fact that the, the wealth of this region is really the driver, right? The real estate uh, is the driver the, of, of what's happening. So that's one kind of additional metric that we could look into. And if I scroll down here further, one of the things that I will show you is, is if we go into the, uh, the, the salary, right? So if I go to this particular uh, NBA player endorsement graph, one of the things that we can see is that, uh, and maybe this is a better one to look at, is that essentially for this NBA season, we also see a similar trend, which is that if I take some of the top players in terms of the endorsement, let's, let's look at who is the most popular in terms of the Wikipedia, right? So if we look at uh, just the Wikipedia data here, we see who's the most popular in 2016 and 2017. We see that it's Steph Curry, right? So Steph Curry is the most popular, LeBron James more, more popular. And then if we look in fact at the endorsements, who's getting the most endorsements? Well, we see that in fact, they're direct, directly related here, right? That the, the players that get the high endorsements also are the most popular, right? Which intuitively makes sense. And, and then if we look at the performance, uh, is we can see that in fact uh, it, it may not be as 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 um, attributable. So if we take, for example, uh, the uh, the wins versus the endorsement, that there there are some uh, there are some things that are maybe non-intuitive. So why is LeBron James 
uh, getting so much more money is it because of his popularity and, and and so this might be another thing to look at where we see this both the housing we also see this with the uh, this particular data set here is that s sometimes that the the popularity right or, or or the fact that they've already got uh, endorsements and salary and if we look at his salary here we can see that the uh, in particular that salary uh, is also related to endorsement. So it's so basically, if you're already wealthy and you're already popular, you get more popular and more wealthy, uh, and that the the performance itself maybe maybe is is less uh, important than popularity contest. And that that's one of the 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 downsides of the Matthew effect is 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 it necessarily doesn't show your um, impact on the world or your performance, but it's just if you already were rich or if you already were popular, you get even more. And so we can also see the same thing uh, in other uh, examples. So if, you know, if, if I wanted to look at some more data here, one of the data sources we'll scroll down here that we'll look at is that um, in, in particular that Let's look at this case study right here, predicting a winning team. So if I go to the NBA, for example, and we, we now dig into this data a little bit further, and we want to create a, a feature that shows you know, which team is a winning, winning team, which one has a winning season, uh, and we scroll down here, we can see here, here's a, here's a scatter plot that shows the age and the wins. Uh, but if I go through here and I want to predict, and I pull in all these different attributes. So let's, let's see, like what, what is it that, that makes a, a player uh, have a, a winning season here? We have age, points, salary, page views, Twitter favorites, uh, winning season, turnovers, great. And if I go and I look at the shape, I can do the same thing that I did earlier. I can you know create this model here, shape it, use logistic regression to predict who's got a winning season. Uh, and in particular, one of the things that we can do once we're done is kind of look at, okay, here's our report, uh, and then go into the feature ranking. And the feature ranking is really where we're going to be able to explain what's happening with this data. So I'm gonna install this tool called um, uh, SHAP here. And, and what this will do is it will allow me to look into the details of why is it that certain players are on, are on certain teams that are winning and, and certain players on certain teams that are losing. And one of the things that we can look at is that there's some non-intuitive effects to what's happening. And so if we want to explain all the features in particular, the, the, the big thing to explain here is that some of these, um, some of these are, are, are non-intuitive. So page views, Twitter favorite count, salary points, all of these kind of factors. So if we go to this plot in particular what it shows us is that kind of unintuitively that this again we see the matthew effect in in play here which is that the 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 best predictors of who will win have a winning season would be how popular they are right and how much they're paid and and, and so this is you know also an interesting thing to dive into details is you know is one driving the other? So is it that the fans, for example, only want to associate and be be um, you know fans of the uh, people with uh, Twitter favorite counts that are high and page views? Like, are they are kind of feeding back on each other? Like, they're, they're you know they're, these are the most popular players, so everybody follows them, and then that leads them to be successful. Or is it that um, because they're successful, they're popular? Uh, and in particular, this salary is is one of the things that is interesting to dive into, which is that uh, the the salary seems to be more of a driver than in fact how many or, or equally a driver as the points. Uh, and, and in particular, you know these these off the court metrics uh, seem to be a play play a role in in predicting the success of of a player. So I think this is one of the things that is an interesting observation. If we also look at this ELI five, which explains the, the the features here, you can kind of see the same thing: is that that some of these, you know, on, on one hand, in this particular uh, explanation, points, salary, page views, 
these are these are the biggest drivers. But it does kind of drive the question is if the teams are already wealthy and they can pay a lot of money in terms of salary, are they able to get the best players? And then the best players get more popular, and then because they're more popular, they're they're able to to attract more players to their team. And so it's this kind of you know uh, um, you know a, 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 a ball rolling down the hill, and it's just grabbing. Or, or a snowball rolling down the hill and is just grabbing more and more snow and more and more attraction. It, this is one of the, the, the areas of research to look into in terms of uh, th this Matthew effect. So now that we know this information, I think uh, maybe the next step would be, you know, okay, we, we've, we've come up with a conclusion, we've told this story, and what could we do to, you know, go to the next level here? So if you're in a company, let's, let's draw really briefly you know, what would be a, a next uh, logical action uh, for you to present these ideas. So we've had lots of different explorations, but it's important to dive into how to present this to other parts of the company, in, you know, and, and how to present this to the executive team and to other places in the company. So what, what I would recommend uh, would be that there, there's essentially two areas of um, presentation so let's go into the presentation here so in terms of presenting uh, your data we have the technical and then we have the verbal uh, method so in terms of the technical this is basically what we went through uh, that would be the the notebook and having a notebook that has a certain structure to it and in particular the, the structure that I would recommend would be that you have the ingestion section of the notebook, you have the exploratory data analysis section of the notebook, you have the modeling section uh, of the notebook uh, here, and then you have the conclusion. And I think this is important to, to have this structure and to potentially put this into, let's say GitHub, uh, like I've done here, as you check this into a GitHub repo, if possible, if it's a public data set, or if it's your company's private data set, you check it into the repo, and, and you and you let other people, if they want to, reproduce all of the work that you've done. And so this is really the important aspect of 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 why you want to check this in is you're you're building reproducible work so that other people uh, are able to look at it and and verify that what you're saying is is actually. Uh, accurate technically, uh, so that's that's really the, the the phase one here. So this would be you know part one, but then when you present it to, let's say the executive team, it's very likely that they don't want to see this, and so that's also a, 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 a misunderstood aspect of presenting the data to an executive team is they may only have, for example. Um, five minutes. So let, let's look at some of the limitations or the constrictions for, we'll call this technical, and we'll call this the CEO, for example. So what, what kind of a presentation would they want? I would say, ideally, you want to tell your story within two to five minutes. You, you want to be able to tell the story. And also, you need to present uh, firm conclusions as well. And, and I think that many executives do not want to just hear um, vague items, right? So if you just talk about the model has this accuracy, you know, uh, or, you know, uh, we, we've, we've discovered some interesting information and we're, we're looking at it and, and you get into the clustering or you get into machine learning, they, they, they may never again invite you into their office. And so what is important is to be very specific, like what do you know? So what do, what do we know? from all the data that I just presented. Well, well I could, the conclusion I would, would give is that there's something called the Matthew effect. And the Matthew effect is present in all of life. And that in California in particular, let's say I'm presenting this to the President of the United States, I would say we need to um, have a logarithmic transformation. <laughs> we need to, to a log transform the Matthew effect. So we need to basically, once you get to a certain level, we need to stop the level so that you don't grow exponentially. We want to transform it, right? So currently what's happening, uh, again, in the United States is wealth is exponential, 
But what we would potentially like to do to help the rest of the United States is do a log transform, which would mean that as you grow here, there's a cap. And basically, it, it doesn't matter after that. So once you get to, let's say, uh, $1 billion, do you really need to, right? And that would be really the, the concept. So that, that's probably what I would present to, this, to the President of the United States or to some executive is, We've, we've, we've observed the Matthew effect in all forms of, of uh, industries and in real estate and wealth. We see it in Major League Baseball players. We see it in real estate. We see it in the NBA. And so what we want to do is we want to have a log transform. We want to stop any exponential growth once it gets to a certain amount. We want people to be wealthy. We want them to do build great things. But we need to, to have a cap here where uh, we need to, to not let... Uh, you know, real estate grow without bounds. We should change the tax policies. And also in terms of education, we should also allow uh, more people to have equally distributed the elite forms of education, right? So that's, that's what I would present to a CEO uh, in terms of a firm conclusion. And we can say, well, how could we do this? Okay, so let's, let's now build into what are the things that I could do to, to, to help this in, in the United States if we want to again present this to the CEO. So let's say this is the president and I'm on the academic uh, advising team, you know, president of the US, and he, he needs some bullet points. Well, what can we do? Well, we can uh, check one. We can uh, have the uh, US tech companies uh, uh, minimum taxation, right? So we know that uh, tech companies have been benefiting from their exponential growth. So they need to have a minimum level of taxation, uh, right? They can't just uh, put their their uh, their uh, operations overseas and then they grow without bounds, right? Because, and again, all of these items will, will have a, a direct um, link to the Matthew effect. And so basically these are counteractive uh, forms uh, to to deal with the Matthew effect in the United States. So we know tech companies, there's a minimum tax. Two, uh, uh, anything that's a monopoly in the U.S., uh, potentially, you know, com tech companies like uh, Google uh, and uh, Facebook in particular uh, uh, do look like they're, they're monopolies. And so what we do is we break them up. So there we go. We have uh, a second thing, break up, break up tech. And now what else can we do? We can look at the, the, the states where there's out of control growth. So let's look at California, for example. You know, and what we do is we, we, um, we eliminate the, uh, the, tax, the, the tax break, uh, the, the real estate tax break. So we have property taxes will uh, now be directly associated uh, with, with the valuation of the house. So we change that so that Again, it's going to logarithmically transform this so that immediately uh, we're going to have to deal. There, there's going to be some details of obviously we don't want to put make people homeless because they have to pay these really high tax bills. But but basically we would change this so that property taxes now there would be some change where they would have to be linked directly with evaluation. And then maybe another thing that we could do as well is if there's um, out of control uh, homeless proper problem in the United States that we, we, we directly address uh, the regions and we, we have a, uh, a link to, to government funding uh, via taxes based on those regions that have high homeless. Right? So we, 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 re, we reallocate government funding potentially by raising the taxes of the people that live in that region because they've directly been responsible you know, in a way by increasing the home prices. So we, we, we raise taxes on them and we, and we allocate some of that to potentially government funded housing, right? So these would be very specific details. So that's, that's in terms of the wealth. We also maybe could uh, have a billionaire tax. So once you get to a billion, billion dollars, maybe, you know, and, and you have a billion uh, in your bank, potentially maybe the tax rate at that point is 90%, right? You, you, how much more do you need? And, and and so then that that money again could go to some of these other areas, so that would be one effect that we could very specifically present to the president. Let's say the president then comes back and says, "Okay, great, uh, I'm going to do that," but 
I also heard you talked about the health. So what else could we do in terms of improving the health of the United States? We know many people are dying from pandemics, from obesity, heart disease. What can we do to affect that? Okay, well, let's let's also do, drop some conclusions for this. So let's again talk to the president and we'll, we'll give him some recommendations based on the data. And uh, in terms of health, well, what, what can we do? Well, we, we know that there's some firm data that talks about the level of education and sugar consumption. So, so maybe one thing we could do is we could tax um, high sugar, right? So, so any high sugar products, potentially that are mostly sugar, like you know soda uh, or candy, uh, you know may, maybe we have we have a, a, a very high tax here. Where where it's potentially you know 300 percent, we have a, we have a we have a tax that's very high that eliminates the the uh, the easy consumption of these products because we know of how toxic sugar actually is to to people's health. So that's one very specific thing we could do immediately. What else could we do? Well, we could also potentially uh, eliminate um, any kind of advertising. Uh, on television, uh, you know, or in in media that has anything to do with um, sugar products, uh, telling people to eat all the time, snacks, right? There's data that says that snacking is harmful, right? Like you 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 potentially don't need to be eating all day, uh, and and we will eliminate those kinds of incorrect um, advertising uh, as well. And then another thing that we could do is we could also uh, uh, tax highly processed foods as well. So we know that the highly processed foods are, are directly linked. Uh, and in fact, I can show you, show you this really quickly. We know that the, uh, the highly processed foods here are directly correlated with uh, weight gain in, in over long term. So we see that sugar sweetened beverages, um, for example, are, are highly processed and they, they lead to weight gain, but there's negatively correlated uh, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fruits, yogurts. So, so what we could do as well is we could we could say that we want to tax highly processed foods as well, uh, and and potentially we want to um, subsidize uh, those other foods, those health, healthier foods. So, so right. So, can we subsidize those those healthy foods and say that we want to potentially even be almost free? Maybe, maybe like foods like nuts and um, fruits and vegetables, you know, maybe there's a, a, an ability to potentially get these for free. And, and the re why is this, for, maybe we would give this for free, is that it's such an impact on the health of the country that, that potentially we want to give this away, just like we let people have, you know, education from, a, from an early age. So these would be very, very specific items that we could tell the, the president that we could do immediately to, to help him out. And he says, oh, great, I like these ideas. We have two problems we've already solved now. We have the Matthew effect, we're helping, we're helping with health. But I also heard you talk about education. Well, what could we do? Well, let's, let's give you some specific uh, details, actionable. So these are called um, SMART. You know, when you talk about a, a recommendation, which is um, you know, basically these are specific, actionable results oriented um, goals, basically. And so in terms of, again, the president and he wants to talk about education, you know, what, what can we do here? We also know that there, there are some problems with education and we saw that that's correlated with high sugar you know, consumption negatively correlated. So, so we know one fact that we know about the United States in particular is that the IV plus, we know that the IV plus, which is basically the Ivy League plus uh, other top universities, that uh, it's 77 times more likely that you'll be uh, a graduate of the IV plus if, what can we guess here? If you're in the 1%, right? So if your parents were rich, you're 77 times more likely to go to an IV plus in the United States. So this again is the Matthew effect. So, so what could we do? Well, potentially what you could do is you could, um, you could have, you know, maybe a, um, 
uh, your, the, the wealth of the individual here. So this could be, you know, um, you know, the, the, the 10%, you know, 25%, uh, the 50%, right? You, you could basically show this is, this would be how, how wealthy people are. And you could, you could essentially do, do the opposite, right? So you could have, you could have, these would be the probability that you're accepted would be higher uh, for uh, lower income and then lower for the higher income. So that, that's one potential solution that you could do is you could you could add a weight to income level, right? And where there's a there's a there's a lower probability of of gain, gaining admission to these universities uh, it, depending on what your what your your income level is, right? So that might be one way that you could you could present that maybe the president likes that idea. What else could you do as well is is potentially you could eliminate. So that's that's one is is negatively weight wealth, uh, and and so the president likes that. What else can we do? We can also say that uh, in terms of the the early education from let's say kindergarten into uh, maybe high school, uh, we could we could have a, a a higher allocation of funds, right? So, so we could we could have um, higher funding. Now, how would we get that higher funding? Well, we talked about that earlier. That the the Matthew effect has been played into many different aspects of the United States in terms of you know the real estate, also in terms of these tech companies that have uh, not been paying taxes. So, tech company taxes, uh, and what we could do is is we could we could reallocate. This this uh, money that has been uh, given to the wealthy, and we could put it into uh, higher funding for this early education. So again, why would we do this? It isn't necessarily to punish the rich. What we want to do is we want to take some of the excess benefits, uh, and I'll again I'll draw this that what the Matthew effect tells us uh, is that the the rich get richer, whoever has will get more. And so there's a certain level where once once you're at once you're at let's say this level, do you need any more, right? Where this is just gratuitous, <laughs> that that basically that 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 surplus, right? Where where this is let's say this is uh, you know 0.001 percent wealth, right? Once once you're at that level, that potentially it's not doing the rest of the world any good. So if we could take that surplus. We want to apply that surplus to to the rest of the world to help them out, so that everybody uh, has a better uh, impact, and even the wealthy have a much better life because uh, there's less homelessness, there's more educated people, uh, more of the the, the benefits uh, of society are equally distributed. So that would be the final conclusion: is we have several categories that we gave the president of the United States here. So this would be the final conclusion that we would give him as we would say, okay, president, let's let's summarize what it is that we're gonna recommend based on data. So we would like you to, to uh, have, have some uh, impact in terms of the taxes. We want you to change those, those items. We also want you to uh, do those things that you talked about in terms of the health. And we also want to do something in terms of education. And as a result of this, what will impact is that all uh, members of society, including the wealthy, will have a better life, uh, will, will improve. So what we're, what we're summarizing is that there is excess capital. Uh, there's, there's, so conclusion A, excess capital is wasted due to the Matthew effect, and it could be reallocated with, without adversely affecting the wealthy as as uh, marginal um, uh, impact to to these ca categories, which is health, education. And as a result, our conclusion to you uh, as the president would be that all society would be improved by uh, the, these measures. And so then we could go through and later measure and see if our conclusions were were able to be successful. So so that's really the in a nutshell, what's important is to to maybe on your own, and let's just kind of summarize this whole thing about data storytelling. You know what it is that we're doing here with with data storytelling. It's that first you have a idea, 
and you you have to you have to get into the idea right so you have the idea and you need to take some time to explore this idea and it could be really wondering and going back and forth and you know this is your start you know and then this is the this is the end uh, and it takes a while and a lot of times uh, the more data sources that you have you know like again we'll, we'll say this many data sources that it will allow you to explore different ideas and, and then uh, in terms of once you've done that, then you need to figure out who your audience is, and that and and that on one hand you should build this technical re repository, and we talked about it. Very important that it's repeatable, so that other people can look at your data, uh, because if they cannot reproduce what you did, it's possible you're spreading misinformation. And, and we know that in the United States, in particular, they have a real problem with uh, misinformation and that many people will spread misinformation and there's no way to prove it, right? It's basically um, uh, falsehoods. And so how do you prevent the spread of misinformation? Well, one of the ways is that you have the data and you let other people reproduce uh, what you built so that they can pr you can prove that you're not spreading misinformation. But that's only for the technical audience, uh, which when you're talking to executive, they may not care. With the executive, what's really important to them is that you have very firm conclusions that you present, right? So they, they, they don't have time to spend two hours hearing about all the different metrics. So I would not be presenting, you know, machine learning details. That that's not gonna be helpful to an executive. They want to have a recommendation. They wanna have a very firm recommendation uh, and now people on their team, they may they may say, well, okay, that's you have some very strong opinions, but uh, about the Matthew effect, but we 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 need to check your work, and I want to look at your and so maybe later the executive team will go back, and they will look at this data, and then they will see that um, they can reproduce your results, and then they can say, okay, the person even though they had very uh, controversial and strong recommendations. We checked out and it turns out that it's true. And, and then it, the, it hopefully what happens is you have, um, you have influenced the decision maker. Maybe in the case of the United States, we've been able to influence the president of the United States and say, listen, we, we could help all of society by applying some of these things that I talked about. Uh, and, and, and then he would potentially take that role. So that's, that's really the dream scenario with uh, a data storytelling. Now, one final thing that I'll bring up here is that, is that you know, really you can do Python, like I, I did, I did I, all the stuff with really advanced Python techniques and machine learning, but you also can do this with uh, no-code, low-code solutions as well. And, and so you, you absolutely can do these technical details you know, there's really two paths here in terms of you have one, which is if you're if you're a programmer, right? If you can code, that's great. Go for it. Go f go through all the examples, and you would have the the notebook. But but you don't necessarily have to be a coder to to do this the 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 data storytelling. You can also do um, no code, and there's many solutions that can do no code, including things like Tableau, for example. You know or uh, the uh, quick site, these are all examples of this. So you don't necessarily have to do it in code as well. It really is, the, the main idea though is it's reproducible uh, and that you've explored many different ideas and many different data sources. Again, you don't have to be a, a, a programmer to grab data from another location. You just need to copy it and put it somewhere so that you can do your analysis. But then again, when you go to executive, very specific recommendations uh, when you're when you're giving them uh, to to the executive. In this lesson, we covered some of the core concepts of data science, and these concepts apply to any kind of discipline, from an MBA program to an MSBA program to a data science program to a current professional that's working in an enterprise company. But the the core ideas are this: uh, if you're going to do a presentation that's technical, have this uh, notebook set up that's reproducible and you have sections of it. You have an ingestion fa phase, you have an exploratory data analysis phase, you have a modeling phase, and you have a conclusion phase. 
That way other people can reproduce your work and you can uh, get a lot of credibility in that you've provided the data that you used when you're gonna present your conclusions. Then when you go to the executive, I wouldn't bring in that notebook, I would go to them with maybe a three minute presentation and be very specific about it, what the thing is that you want them to do. I'd like you to um, fix the property taxes in California, or I would like to uh, you know, fix education in, in the United States uh, by uh, allocating more resources to the kindergarten through, through um, let's say sixth grade. Uh, and those are all ideas that can be very specific and there could be uh, action items included in those. And that way, the executive doesn't have to go and dive into R squared or you know model accuracy or all of these kind of esoteric forms that they, they really may not care about. So that's the key idea when you're building a recommendation is there's a technical side and then there's a business side. And with the business side, be very specific about what it is that you're asking for.